My name is David Henderson, and I've prepared this video for the Clan Henderson Society. My Henderson ancestors were Ulster Scots who settled Appalachia in the 18th century. In fact, over half of the extended families on my family tree were Ulster Scots. So in this video, I'd like to share some of the research I've done on the Ulster Scots. We will look at the conditions in Scotland in 1600, at the beginning of the Ulster Plantation, where in Scotland the residents who moved to Ulster came from, why they moved to Ulster. Then we'll look at the conditions in Ulster during the 1600s and the changes in Ulster that caused these people to migrate to America in the 1700s and later. And we will look at where they settled when they came to America. So first let's take a look at Scotland in 1600. The population of Scotland is estimated to have been about 500,000, a half a million people. The largest town was Edinburgh with about 10,000 people. The vast majority of the people in Scotland lived in the areas that are not shaded, the southwest lowlands, the eastern lowlands, and the eastern coastal plain. The eastern lowlands had good soil for farming and were productive. On the other hand, the southwest lowlands, south of Glasgow, had very poor soil and were difficult to farm. All of the major towns in Scotland at this point were close to the sea. In Edinburgh, the 10,000 people mostly lived underground in squalid underground rooms. It's worth a visit if you're in Edinburgh to Mary King's Close, which preserves some of the original habitats that these people lived in so long ago. The diagram of Edinburgh in this picture shows multiple levels of these chambers. The people lived in these chambers and moved around through passageways like the one on the right. The thing you have to realize is that there were no plumbing. And so everyone had chamber pots in their apartments. And it, when the chamber pots became full, they would dump them out into the alleyway. So you can imagine what this alleyway would have been like in 1600 with three or four levels of apartments dumping all of their refuse out into the into the alleyway. Life for farmers in the lowlands was difficult. There were very few trees. They had long since been cut for timber. There were few or no fences. So sheep and cattle roamed around when they got out of control and often damaged crops. Farming methods were quite primitive. There was no proper drainage, and farmers used wooden plows pulled by multiple oxes or even sometimes by people. The farmers didn't own the land. They were tenants, and the tenant farmer's land was frequently shifted. So one year, he, the farmer would have a particular piece of land, and the next year he would be moved to a different spot. Because of this, the farmers had no reason to improve the land that they farmed, and this led it to be rapidly degraded. The people who lived in the lowlands along the English border were a melting pot of many different backgrounds. They included Celts, Romans, Frisians, Angles, Saxons, Danes, Norwegians, Normans, and Flemings. As a result of this huge mixture of backgrounds, the Henderson DNA Project has discovered that Hendersons come from a huge variety of ancient backgrounds. And so this vast diversity of, of mixing is reflected in the DNA of today's Hendersons. The social order in the lowlands had basically five levels. The noble Matir was the owner of a large chunk of the, of the property. With Under him were the lairds, the freeholders. The lairds managed land leases and farming, 
and of course paid taxes to the noble Matir. The next tier down were the kindly tenants. They received the same land allotment each year, so they were relatively stable. Most of them were relatives, cousins, etc. of the lairds. The largest group by far were the joint tenants. These were men who were assigned to a single land lease, usually a group of men. It required multiple men to get enough oxen and tools to farm the land. And so a group of men would be joint tenants on a particular piece of land, and their tenancy would move to different pieces of land in different years. At the bottom of the social structure were the subtenants. These were basically hired hands who worked on the farms, but had no land rights of their own. For the most part, they were given a spot on which to build a house and a kitchen garden. These people would have been serfs during the feudal period. Homes in the lowlands were very crude. Some were built of just stacking stones with a thatched roof. Others were built entirely of twigs and mud and thatch. Inside the house, a fire would be built on the floor. There was no chimney and no hearth, only a fire on the floor for cooking and for heating and a hole in the ceiling to let the smoke go out. I got to visit a reconstruction of such a house at the Frontier Cultural Museum in Stanton, Virginia some years ago. It was a winter day and it was quite cold. So we went into this house. There was a fire on the floor and we sat on short stools. If you were close to the floor, the air was fairly clean, but you were cold. As you stood up, it got warmer, but it also got smoky. So you had the choice between being cold and breathing fresh air or being warm and breathing smoke. At night, the farm animals were brought into the house and placed at one end away from the fire. This was done for two reasons. One, to protect them from weather, but more importantly, protect them from the border reavers who were constantly stealing animals. Life in the lowlands was difficult. There were frequent wars. England and Scotland engaged in wars back and forth over the years, and the local lairds tended to fight each other as well. One reason that the homes were so crude was so that they could be rebuilt rapidly when they were damaged in raids and wars. It's said that they could rebuild one of these stone houses in about three days after it was torn down. Living conditions were very unstable, and there was little or no incentive to improve on your property, so things stayed pretty bad and pretty much the same. I mentioned the border reavers. The reavers were used as soldiers during the war, and they often raided either their neighbors in Scotland or across the border into England. Reaving was a way of life. And anyone who was not part of your clan or family was fair game to go and steal their crops or their cattle. The Reavers were excellent horsemen, and they had small horses that could travel across the rocky, boggy land quickly. Interestingly, the term blackmail comes from this period. Protection money against the Reavers was a part of their, of their income. And blackmail is an ancient Scottish term for protection money. So these raids were carried out to steal livestock. And we know that Henderson families were among the border reavers. The border reavers uh, are shown here. There are several different styles uh, of weapons. But this was a way of life for many people in the border areas. The Ulster Plantation dates to about 1607. There were a variety of reasons why the King of England, at this point King James I of England and the Sixth of Scotland, wanted to 
form this plantation. The English monarchs had been concerned about Ireland for some time. The population of Ireland was Catholic, and when England became a Protestant uh, country, they were very concerned that the Irish people would allow a Spanish invasion of England. Spain would come into to Ireland, where they would be greeted as, uh, as heroes, rescuing them from the Protestant English, and, and Ireland would then become a base of operations for an invasion of England. The English also considered the Irish to be very uncivilized. So the goal of the Ulster Plantation was to replace the Irish, at least in Northern Ireland, with loyal Scots and English farmers to provide some protection. In 1607, the two earls that controlled six counties of Ulster fled Ireland as a result of some conflict and went to continental Europe. So after 1607, it was necessary to settle the land that was confiscated from the two earls. And so, the, so King James decided to settle this land with Scottish and English farmers. The other goal of King James was to clear the western lowland of the Reavers. In 1605, King James began to try to establish order on the border between England and Scotland and eliminate the Reavers. So in 1607, as the altar plantation began, the lowland farmers from the lowlands of Scotland on the west were moved over to Ulster in an effort to both remove people from the Scottish lowlands and establish a English-Scottish population in Ulster. And in fact, by 1620, the border area between England and Scotland had been pacified. During the 90 years between 1607 and 1697, it's estimated that 200,000 Scottish Presbyterians were relocated into Ulster. There was also regular migration between the Lowland Scots going to Antrim and Down. This was a fairly regular part of life in the Lowlands because County Antrim and County Down were so close to the border to the Lowlands in Western Scotland that there was a fair bit of migration back and forth between the two. County Antrim and County Down were not part of the Ulster Plantation, which consisted of just six counties. To form the Ulster Plantation, land grants were given to 250 English and Scottish aristocrats. These grants were typically between 1,000 and 3,500 acres. Each grant required that the aristocrat settle the land with farmers. Both lowland Scots and English farmers were allowed, but by and large, the English farmers didn't want to go to Ireland. And so the vast majority of the settlers were lowland Scots. The landowner would build a castle to defend the land as needed, and all tenant males were required to be ready to defend Ulster in the event of an attack. They were to displace the native Catholic Irish inhabitants and take over Ulster. Land in Scotland was actually more profitable at this point for raising sheep than for farming. And since the Southwest lowlands were not well suited for farming, but okay for sheep grazing, the farmers in the lowlands were really not wanted or needed. And that prompted them to be moved to Ulster. There were a variety of groups that received these land grants. Scottish and English gentry were among these groups, some of whom moved to, to Ulster to sort of inhabit their property and some of whom remained as, uh, as absentee landlords. Veterans of the Irish War were granted land. London companies, the Church of Ireland, 
and Trinity College Dublin were all among those who received grants in Ulster. There were also a group of Protestant soldiers called servitors who were granted land. They would provide protection on a regular basis. They were to build houses rather than castles, and the servitors were the only group that was officially allowed to use Irish tenants on their farms. In all, 250 grants were made, and each was to pay a thousand pounds per year to the royal treasury. So the Ulster plantation would generate a quarter of a million pounds a year for the monarchy. Each land grant was responsible for building a bawn to provide protection and a center of life for the town. I found these pictures of three different bawns, and they show that they essentially are a walled fortress type area with either a castle or a church or house uh, inside. The land was leased to farmers, and the farmers, of course, paid for their lease with their crops. The major difference in these leases between the Ulster Plantation and the old Lowland Scotland leases was that the Ulster leases were long-term leases, usually 30 or 31 years. This encouraged the leaseholders to make property improvements, to build better houses, and to take care of their land. And in theory, at least, these leases could be passed down to your children. For the most part, a 31-year lease represented a lifetime opportunity for staying in a particular piece of land. And the houses were built better, and they began to use hearths. And we know that because by the 1660s, they were doing an inventory of hearths and actually charging a tax on the number of hearths that you had in your house. So the Ulster Plantation included about 500,000 acres of farmable land in six counties, Donegal, Coleraine, Tyrone, Armagh, Cavan, and Fremenagh. This map shows the, the counties, and it also shows where the immigrants came from. The darker areas in Scotland, Scotland are the areas that contributed more settlers to the Ulster Plantation. And you see the darkest area runs from Glasgow along the western coast. There are also areas along the border, uh, which would have been border reavers and farms in that area. Some immigrants from further north of Glasgow, and just a few from the east coast of Scotland. Um, and as I mentioned before, while some English farmers came, for the most part, they didn't want to come to Ireland. Life in Ulster was definitely better than life in the Scottish lowlands, but it was still barely a subsistence operation. A farmer received only between 20 and 33 percent of the revenue that, from farming, with the rest going to pay the landowner and for services such as milling. The variety of oats that was planted in Ulster at this time was actually a very poor variety. Typical plant produced only about three seeds. So one seed went to the landowner, one seed went to the miller, and one had to be saved for planting next year, leaving very little to eat. My family has an Appalachian folk tune that was passed along to me from my father and from his father to him called the Miller, which talks a little bit about the way millers often cheated people uh, out of their grain. I've recorded this folk tune and you can find it, I think, on the CHS YouTube channel. It wasn't until about 1690 that Scott's finally became the majority of the population in Ulster. The Scots were never able to fully displace the Irish Catholics. Even though they were not allowed to rent land, 
the Irish were used as laborers by the Scots who found they needed additional farm labor. So the Irish essentially took on the, the role of, of laborers for the Scots. There was remarkably little mixing between the Irish and Scots in terms of intermarriage. We don't have any census data for Ulster in this century. The closest thing that exists is something called the muster of 1630. As I mentioned, each estate was required to be prepared to defend Ulster. And so in 1630, a list was made of all adult men and their weapons in each of the various land grant areas. At this point, there were 13,000 adult Scotsmen who were listed as members of the muster. And 49 of these were Hendersons. I've summarized this data in the table, and you see that the majority of the Hendersons lived in Londonderry, Antrim, Donegal, and Down, slightly less in Tyrone, and only one in County Cavan. The wealth of these men can be shown by the weapons they own, because the, the muster roll also lists what weapons were owned by each man. So 20 of these 49 Hendersons had no arms, meaning they were relatively poor. 29 had weapons of various kinds. The weapons involved swords, which are self-explanatory, pikes, muskets, and snap -hances. Now, I had no idea what snap -hances were, so I looked it up. A snap was a firing mechanism using flint and steel that was used for rifles and pistols. So every snap hands represented a possible firearm. The pikes were basically long poles with a steel spear point on the end, not used for throwing, but used for poking. The Ulster Scots were Presbyterian, and the ability to read the Bible was extremely important to Presbyterians. Followers of John Knox were expected to be able to read the scriptures. And so virtually all of the churches in Ulster had schools associated with them. As a result of this, most Ulster Scot men could read, and the same applied in Scotland as well. So the Scottish population and the Ulster Scots were more educated than the Irish Catholics, and probably more educated than many of the, the uh, rural English farmers. The ministers in the Presbyterian Church tended to be men of reasonably high moral standing, and they basically practiced what they preached. So they were relatively popular, and they instilled in their congregations a sense of morality. And a national identity formed around this Presbyterian faith and Presbyterian identity. The other important aspect of the Presbyterian Church is that it is highly democratic. Each Presbyterian church is essentially a self-governing democracy in which all of the members have a say in what's going to happen. And the church actually hires the ministers. So the Scotch-Irish, the Ulster Scots, had a very strong sense of self-government in their church. And the churches are organized into presbyteries which are representative democracies. So the democracy of each congregation then sends representatives to the presbytery to make decisions that affect multiple churches. And so there's a real sense of representative democracy that grows up around the Presbyterianism of Ulster and Scotland. As a result of this, Scotland and Ulster became relatively civilized and also rather puritanical. The Ulster Plantation was, was quite an economic success. In fact, its success became a problem for England. It was so productive that the English businesses began to face serious competition from Ulster. The first effort to block this competition was the Staple Act of 1663 in which the English Parliament banned trade by Ulster with both Europe and the colonies of North America. 
So Ulster merchants could only sell materials to England. The competition for Ulster wool and linen was also a problem for the English, and that led the English to restrict trade in linen and wool also. So the Woolens Act of 1669 limited exports of wool and linen products only to England. So the English were actively suppressing uh, the output and the productivity of Ulster because it was competing with them so well. Another change that led to the Great Immigration was the introduction of a rack rent system for land leases. As the land leases began to expire at the end of the 1600s, the landowners began to increase the rents. The rents had been fixed for generations, but suddenly they were allowed to increase the rent. And because the Scots had increased the value of land, the rents doubled and more. The owners, of course, had debts and they wanted to extract every pound they could from the land. So it's understandable that they would increase the rents. The other thing that happened was that the local Catholic Irish began to compete for leases. So a group of Irishmen would band together to outbid the Scot who had lived on the land for generations and take over the land. So the Irish Catholics began to displace the Protestant Scots from their land. At the same time, those who had immigrated to America starting around 1680 began to report positively back about conditions in America. Ads began to appear in the local newspapers promising land and transport to America. Another thing that prompted the immigration, possibly the next to the last straw in this process, was the Test Act. The Test Act was originally designed to marginalize Catholics. It required that everyone join the Church of England. Of course, the Presbyterians didn't want to do this. And when the Test Act was turned against the Presbyterians to try to force them into the Church of England, that caused a big problem in Ulster. The ministers were removed from all of the churches in Ulster, and Presbyterians who didn't join the Church of England were not able to marry, baptize their children, bury their dead, serve in the military, or even teach in the schools. The final straw was the weather. A drought began in 1714 and continued for four years. 1717 saw a major crop failure, and that prompted the first massive wave of immigration to America. People had been leaving for some time, but it, the wave really started in 1717. Exact numbers are not clear, but at least 12 or 13 shiploads of people, each with 100 to 200 people, arrived in Philadelphia that summer. It's thought that about 55 shiploads went to New England in the six years between 1714 and 1720. The second wave in 1725 to 29 was again prompted by famine and thousands of families left. In fact, it's reported that entire towns would immigrate together from Ulster to America. And most of these immigrants went to Pennsylvania, as we'll discuss later. The third wave was another famine in 1740-41. By this point, immigrants were beginning to overwhelm the available land in Pennsylvania. Immigrants began to settle illegally in Native American land in the western parts of Pennsylvania. As many as 10,000 people a year were coming. The fourth wave was another drought, 1754 and 55. By this point, some of these immigrants were able to go to North Carolina as well. The governor of North Carolina at this point was actually an Ulster Scot, and he encouraged immigrants to come there as well as to Philadelphia. The fifth wave was 1771 to 1775. This wave was caused because the Marquis of Antrim 
lost his lease on the land and all of his tenants were evicted. So about 17,000 people left Ulster for America in 1771-1772. At this point, up to 3,500 people a week were arriving in Philadelphia. So the Ulster diaspora uh, is broken down by various sources in various ways. This particular set of, of pictures shows the level of immigration during different periods. So 1680 to 1750, about 70,000 Ulster Scots left for America, with smaller numbers going to Europe and Britain. 1750 to 1820 saw another 150,000 immigrants. And the period from 1710 to 1775 is thought to have included about 200,000, although some place it as high as 400,000. 1820 to 1890 saw 1 1.3 million people immigrate to North America. A large number of these in the 1841 to 51 period were caused by the potato famine, which also prompted a large number, an even larger number of Irish Catholics to immigrate. And then 1851 to 1890 saw almost three quarters of a million uh, people immigrate to North America from Ulster. And then the period 1890 to 1960 saw another 363,000, most of these before 1930. You'll also notice at this point, a large number of Ulster people are going back to Great Britain. So the total Ulster diaspora from 1717, when the first wave occurred, to 1960, is thought to have been about 1.9 million Ulster Scots immigrating to North America. And in 1960, the Scotch-Irish and Irish were the largest single group in the U.S. population. So where did these people go? The vast majority went initially to Pennsylvania. The Quakers in Pennsylvania were the only colony in the 13 original that would allow and welcome Ulster Scots. One would have expected New England Calvinists to welcome them because they shared the Calvinist form of Protestant faith. But the Boston residents felt they were uncivilized. So those who landed in Boston and New England were generally forced to move west and north. Some settled in New Hampshire, some went further north into Canada. So as the settlers arrived in Pennsylvania, they pushed west gradually to Chester and then Lancaster and beyond. The Quakers had maintained very good relations with Native Americans. Quakers are pacifists, and so they always tried to buy land from the Native Americans and establish treaties. As the Ulster Scots and other immigrants began to move into Native American land, the Quakers would send their soldiers to remove the offending farms. But of course, the Ulster Scots were used to rebuilding their houses, so they would just move over to another piece of land and build another house. So it was sort of a whack-a-mole game that went on for a while. By 1756, the immigrants to Pennsylvania actually outnumbered the Quakers. And the, the, the Scotch-Irish were able to take over political control of the state. At this point, they abandoned the efforts to make treaties with the Native Americans and basically started expelling them from their land and, and warring with the Native Americans. Now, the Scot-Irish were not the only immigrants into Pennsylvania. There were also substantial numbers of Germans, but as with the Irish Catholics, the Scot-Irish Presbyterians did not mingle very much with the German Lutherans. As the Scot-Irish immigrants moved west, they followed an Indian path. There were a well-established Indian path that went down the Shenandoah Valley into Tennessee and down into Georgia. And so this became the immigration trail that these immigrants followed. 
Initially, for example, in 1740, when my ancestors went to Augusta County, Virginia, all travel was on horseback or on foot. But the immigrants rapidly converted this Indian trail into a road, which became known as the Great Valley Wagon Road. The city of Stanton in the heart of the Shenandoah Valley was established in 1740. By 1768, Charlotte, North Carolina had been chartered. And by 1786, a fort was built in what is now Knoxville, which was officially chartered in 1790. So what we see is that the Scotch-Irish moving out of Pennsylvania, moved down through Appalachia and settled this region. So the vast majority of the people who settled Appalachia, uh, Central Virginia, the Piedmont of North Carolina and South Carolina into Knoxville, into Kentucky, into West Virginia were our Scotch-Irish ancestors. Now much of what I've learned about the Scotch-Irish comes from a book called The Scotch-Irish A Social History by James Leyburn. So if you'd like to learn more about these interesting people, this is a fabulous book uh, to read. I also encourage you, if you're in the Stanton, Virginia area, to visit the Frontier Cultural Museum, which has recreations of the homes of Scotch-Irish, both in, in Ireland and in America, and also houses that the Germans immigrants would have lived in as well. I've also listed a few websites that I used and that provide some additional information on these groups. I hope you've enjoyed this, this video and that you'll do more reading on our ancestors, the Scotch-Irish.